all pray for me I'm gonna pray for you let's look to the Lord and ask him to bless his word father we come before you in the name of Jesus thanking you for meeting us in this time of worship and now dear God we ask that you would meet us through your word dear God I ask that you would hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you I pray that the seed of your word would fall on good ground and produce fruit in the lives of these your people for your glory for their joy and the good of the nations Oh God, would you do this for your namesake and for your glory? Dear God, I do not account my life as anything valuable nor precious to myself. My only aim, my singular focus, is to complete the task that you have given unto me, the task of testifying to the good news of the gospel. Dear God, would you throw your weight around and show yourself to be glorious in this place today? It's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Let the church of the living God say amen. 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 And amen. So recently I read an article about some of the greatest summer playlist songs of all times. And, 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 and I'm pleased, humbly I might ask, to say that um, the, the list showed that I got good taste when it comes to music. <laughs> uh, because five of my all-time favorites for a summer playlist made the list. Some of y'all might remember some of them. Um, for me, these were staples at the cookout. Like it's not a cookout if you're not playing these loud on the speakers. Uh, the first one is 1979, cut from the elements themselves, earth, wind, and fire. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Body, uh, something is, I can't sing, but y'all know the song. Y'all know the song. Y'all know the song. Yeah, so you got that one. In 1981, you got the hit from Frankie Beverly and Mays, Before I Let Go. Boom, the boom, the boom, boom, the boom, the boom, right? You gotta have, it ain't a cookout if you ain't playing that, now. You know what I mean? Drunk Uncle Somewhere, that, that's my story. Maybe that's not y'all's. That's, that's, that's my story. <laughs> 1991 cut, right? Like, it is not summertime. I don't care what the date is on the calendar. If it ain't some hot dogs on the grill and some people having fun in the backyard, and this song is playing in my family. The, uh, the 1991 cut by Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff. Y'all know what it is. Summertime. Gotta, 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 gotta play summertime. Gotta have summertime at the cookout. But here's the one from uh, the, the, the queen of R&B herself. You got to have this at the cookout. Came out of 1992. Mary J. Blige. Who remember Real Love? Real Love. Boom, boom. The boom, boom, boom. I'm searching for a real love. He, he better be Jesus. He better be Jesus. He bets to be Jesus. <laughs> right? And here, here, here's the last one to round out my top five list. Y'all got to remember this one in 1995 by Montel Jordan. This is how we do it. La, da, 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 da. Look at y'all. Montel Jordan, the pastor now. We keeping it Jesus. Chill out. Chill out. Chill out. Chill out. Those are my top five, and I recommend you add them to your summer playlist. But what if I told you, family, that God the Holy Spirit authored the original playlist long before Apple and Spotify music? What if I told you that scripture has a soundtrack, if you will, and the Lord is, wants to use it um, to help uh, accelerate church, listen and learn from it this summer? What if I told you that the Bible has a playlist of songs, not just for you to enjoy some fun in the sun at cookouts, but to encourage your faith in Jesus, the eternal Son of God, family? My good friend, Pastor Ernest Grant, told me that you are launching a brand spanking new sermon series here at Accelerate called Playlist. Somebody say Playlist. playlist. Somebody say Playlist. playlist. Where well, each week you're going to get a life-giving message from a different psalm that will be preached from God's ancient playlist, which still has relevance for our lives today. Amen, somebody. Amen. Now, I absolutely love the psalms. I love them personally, but I also love them pastorally. They're such a blessing to me. I love them because the Psalms are full of language. We, in the Psalms, we see a wide range of human emotion expressed, where the people of God communicate with God no matter what season of life they find themselves in, family. For, for an example, if you're struggling to be grateful and have gratitude, you can just flip over to Psalms 100 because it's a Thanksgiving song. If you're struggling with making a decision in your life and you just need the Lord's wisdom and counsel, you can just flip over to Psalms chapter 1 and get some wisdom and direction for your life. If you're struggling to know what it is to praise and worship the Lord like you lost your ever-loving mind because he deserves it, you can just flip over to Psalms chapter 8. The Psalms give us language for whatever season of life we are in to communicate with our great God and King. If you're going through a tough time, there are, there's an aspect of the Psalms called the laments. Somebody say laments. Laments are actually, they make up the largest category of the Psalms. And in fact, it's a common theme throughout the of scripture. 
Did you know that there's actually a book of the Bible called Lamentations, which literally means funeral song. I love that we serve a God who, in the same Bible that says, count it all joy when you go through trials, it also got a whole book called Lamentations. In other words, we serve a God who's willing to meet us no matter what season of life we are going through, family. And get this, family, if you were to say to yourself, I'm going to pray through the Psalms over the next 150 days, you know what you would find? That 70% of your prayers would be laments to the Lord. You know why? Because 70% of the Psalms, contrary to popular belief, is actually laments, just that. God's people lamenting before him about stuff going on in their life that they know that he can only give the answer to. And in Psalms 13, David laments to God in what apparently was a season of prolonged hardship or, or suffering in some way, form, or fashion. He, he, he wanted to know, likely how me and you would want to know, uh, where is God and, 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 and if God can, can show up and do something in this situation. Maybe that's exactly where you find yourself here today, family. In a prolonged season of what you perceive to be suffering through loneliness, perhaps in your singleness. A prolonged season of, of feeling forgotten, even in your marriage, because contrary to popular belief, you can feel lonely in your marriage sometimes. A prolonged season of discouragement in your calling. You, you know God has called you to do this, but the grind and the grit of doing whatever it is that God has called you to do is overwhelming to you and it's difficult. A prolonged season of, of grieving the loss of a loved one. A prolonged season of being defeated by a sin that when you read the scriptures, you know you got victory over, but you just keep falling to that thing over and over and over and over again. Am I knocking on somebody's door just yet? Family, if you're in a season of, of suffering in any way, or if you know somebody, right, who's in a season of suffering, because my Bible says that God's church should be one of both the comforted and the comforters. Amen, somebody. So if you're suffering mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or financially, this prayer of lament in Psalms 13 is for you. Because I believe God understands something about us, family. It's not always the pains that's the sharpest that derails his people. Sometimes it's the pain that simply lasts the longest that derails his people. It can lead even the most strongest believer to despair. So if you're someone you know is suffering right now, know that God has placed Psalm 13 on his playlist just for you, fam. So I want to walk you through Psalms 13, and I want to give you four ways to pray through the pain. Amen? Four ways to pay, pray through the pain. That's actually the title of my message today for those of y'all who like tags and, and titles, how to pray through the pain. Psalm 13, let me read it for your hearing. David says, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long would you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Verse 5, it turns, it says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, David says, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Family, would you join me in just giving the Lord a hand praise really quickly for the reading of his word. Four things to consider. Number one, as you pray through the pain, you need to let God know how you feel. That's what we learned in this text. When the pain hits, hear me, family, let God know how you feel. Family, I want to draw your attention to how real, how raw, how unpoliced, how unsanitized David shares his feelings with the eternal God of the universe. This is a man after God's own heart, we learn in Scripture. His relationship with God was so deep that he freely expressed his emotions with honesty before a holy God. In other words, he doesn't romanticize or sanitize how he felt about his suffering. Come on, somebody. He didn't offer some plastic and pious prayer pretending like he wasn't in pain. David didn't try to theologize his troubles away in this text. No, that's not what we see. He tells the Lord exactly how he feels without censor. And Accelerate Church, I stopped by to tell you that the joy and comfort of this text is that God gives you the freedom to do the same, family. I don't care what type of hurt it is, what type of hardship it is, what type of suffering it is. God wants you to pour all of it out on him. Psalm 62 verse 8 says, God says, pour out your heart on me. I love that phrase, pour out. Uh, the psalmist doesn't say trickle out your heart to him. 
He doesn't say splash it out on him. He says pour it out on him. I, I'm an avid football fan. Shout out to the Eagles fans out here. Amen. In Jesus' name. Oh, I ain't getting no love at Accelerate. <laughs> I'm an avid football fan. And one of the things that happens in, at a football game is whenever the team wins, they become so overwhelmed with emotions that they take this big bucket, this Gatorade jug, it'll be full of Gatorade or it'll be full of water, and they will pour it on top of the coach who guided them along the way. They will pour it on top of this, this, this coach who, who taught them and trained them along the way. And they will pour it without abandon. They will pour it not caring about where it goes, where it falls, who, who it splashes on and that is the same way that God is calling us to come to him in the midst of our pain I don't care what you're going through he says don't you trickle your pain out to me don't you just splash he says pour it out all of it on me family without censor listen when the pain hits God wants us to keep it a hundred with him he wants us to hear he wants to hear how you feel and here's what you need to know about the Lord fam <laughs> he is not fragile like glass he is God <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying to you, family? In other words, he can actually handle your honesty. Somebody needs to hear that. Your honesty can't hurt him, literally. Your emotions will never exhaust him, literally. Your difficulties cannot discourage him, literally. And your pain will never perplex him. He says, bring it all to me. I imagine that there's some people here are watching online. You came here today with questions. It wasn't your desire to praise God necessarily that got you out of the bed. It was the questions you have in your heart that you need God to answer. And oftentimes I remember when I was growing up, my grandma would say, don't ever question God. But I, and I know grandma meant well, but, but I got a problem with that grandma. I love you. I, I love you. You taught me a lot. But I think you missed it on that because David, a man after God's own heart, asked God four questions in his head. Four times David says, how long? How long? How long? How long? Have you ever been there, fam? Late in the midnight hour. No friends, no, no family, no, nobody to understand you, and all you have on your heart is questions. I wonder if some people watching online or here understand what it is to have questions for God. God, I'm going through, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know what the way, and I just got questions. I need you to speak to me. I need you to help me. I need you to guide me. I need you to show me the way because I can't find it on my own. Have you ever been there, family? Consider this, family. David, while he wasn't imperfect, David was a godly man, fam. He was a mature believer. And yet even being godly and mature did not give him access to a life of ease and comfort where he didn't have problems and questions before God. See, sometimes I think we deceive ourselves into thinking because I'm serving the way I need to serve, because I'm giving the way I need to give, because I'm loving the way I need to love, then ain't no suffering and hardship going to come to my life. Suffering is not a sign that you are somehow some weak and immature believer. Suffering is a part of life. Even Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. I wonder if I got some overcoming sufferers in this room. I, I, I've been through some stuff, but I don't look like what I've been through because my God has taught me how to overcome by his grace. David was a mature believer and he struggled through some things to no fault of his own oftentimes. And Accelerate, this teaches us that questioning God is not a sign of no faith. It's actually a sign of true faith. Get that in your soul. Questioning God. It's not a sign of no faith. It's actually a sign of true faith. How do I know this? Because there are people all throughout the biblical narrative who had doubts and questions for God. Come here, Thomas. The apostle Thomas struggled to believe in one of the most foundational uh, 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 doctrines in the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus. Yet Jesus invited him to search the mystery of his wounds. And Thomas would declare that you are my Lord and my God. John the Baptist, come here. God, he, he, he was doubting Jesus when, when, when Jesus, when, when he was in prison, right, for the sake of speaking truth to power right right and, and, and they came to him he said he he sent them to, uh, to Jesus he said are you the one or should I wait on another and Jesus didn't even answer his question he said tell them what you see <laughs> tell them what you see tell them the mute are talking the, the lame are walking and I'm, and I'm healing people all throughout the biblical narrative some of the giants of the faith struggled with doubt doubt doesn't mean you don't have faith but sometimes doubt is the doorway for God to deepen your faith 
I want God to set you free. The Holy Spirit used David to write laments like Psalm 13 because he knew people like you and I would need to know how to pray in seasons of prolonged suffering. Now the question, now this question I should say of how long in the text, it reveals a threefold struggle that I think we can identify that David has in the text. People with me, family. David had a struggle with his enemies. He had a struggle with himself, but he also had a struggle with God. First of all, let's talk about the struggle with his enemy. Psalm 13, verse 2, the B clause of that text says, How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Have you ever felt like your enemy was being exalted over you? <laughs> like, I, I don't get this, Lord. I, I'm yours, <laughs> but they over me. I don't, I don't get this. Now understand this. And it's the same David who said in Psalms 23 that the Lord prepared a table for him in the presence of his enemies. This is the same David who said that the Lord would make his enemies his footstool in Psalm 110. But somehow or another, the tables are turned here for David. And now he says, I'm not over my enemy, my enemy is over me. They're oppressing me, and according to verse 4, defeating me and then boasting about their victory. Lord, I need you to do something here. Verse 4, lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. First and foremost, David is struggling because of his enemies. But he's also struggling with himself. Nope. Verse 2, the A call, he says, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? In other words, David has tried thinking himself through his own thoughts. Have you ever been there? <laughs> He's tried self-soothing and self-counseling himself, trying to do everything. that he, I, I, I know some wisdom. I'm going to try to Bible my way through this. I'm going to try to theologize my way through this. All of that stuff is good. But here's what David concludes. I tried to make sense of this situation, but I found no solution for my suffering. And in fact, it's leading me to more sorrow in my heart. So his enemies are flexing on him. His wisdom has failed him. But, but, but here's the biggest struggle that David feels like he's struggling with. He feels like God has forgotten him. He's struggling with God. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me, he says. See, Jacob wasn't the only one in Scripture who wrestled with God. We see David here wrestling with the Lord as well through a time of prolonged suffering. You know, coming up, I was an uh, avid uh, wrestling fan. Any wrestling fans in here coming up? Who remember Monday Night Raw, right, Friday Night Smackdown? Who remember the rock with the people's eyebrow? Some of y'all might remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who remember Stone Cold? Psh, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> right, 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 right. But my favorite wrestler of all time was no doubt Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh yeah, brother. Who remember the Slim Jim commercial? I, 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 I lost some of y'all, you know. I'll Google it. <laughs> uh, but, but Macho Man, I loved him because he had this, this really, uh, I, I loved his finishing move. He would climb up to the top rope. And then he would fly through the air with his elbow and then land on top of his opponent. The referee would go, one, two, three, and it was a wrap. I love watching Macho Man climb up to the top of the rope and then land on his opponent to victory. But here's my question I have for you, Accelerate family. What happens when life lands on you that way? What do you do when you feel like you're on the receiving end of a flying elbow drop from Macho Man Randy Savage? What do you do when you find yourself wrestling with God in a season of prolonged suffering like David. David is struggling with feelings of abandonment. He feels forgotten and forsaken by God. Have you ever felt like God turned his back on you? He expresses himself freely with both honesty and humility. So don't miss that, family. <laughs> David expresses himself freely with honesty and humility. See, David understood that he had the freedom to tell the Lord how he felt, but he did not have the freedom to tell the Lord what to do. Come on, somebody. In other words, he had the freedom to express himself, but he did not have the freedom to be entitled. Be careful of being entitled in your prayer life, family. Like God is some genie in the sky who you rub and get what you want when you want to know. You bow to his will, he doesn't bow to yours. How do we know David expressed himself without entitlement? We know this because after he asked, after he said how long, he addressed God with the covenant title of Lord, Yahweh. <laughs> See that reference? This is a tough word for somebody, but watch this. Be aware of the sin of arrogance and pride in seasons of prolonged pain. God never promised any of us a pain-free life, and he doesn't owe us anything. He invites us to voice our hurts, and he wants to hear us, but we must honor him if we want him to hear us. Come on, somebody. 1 Peter 5, 5, one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture, it says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
I wonder if I have some people in the audience or watching online who want God's grace. I wonder if I uh, got some people listening to me today who know you and need God's grace in different ways and different spaces of your life that you're going through difficulty. Well, can I tell you that the way to receive grace is from a posture of humility. <laughs> you, you, you can't receive grace unless you're humble enough to acknowledge you need it. Free to express our pain but not entitled. Free to tell daddy what's going on but not free to tell daddy what to do. Free to be honest, but we must do it with humility. When the pain is unbearable and you wonder how you can hold on, Psalm 13 teaches us to pray. Let God know how you feel with honesty and humility. But not only do we let God know how we feel, while you're there, family, I, I want you to let God know what you need. <laughs> let him know what you need. Verse, th verse 3, consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. My son Joshua, who's here with me today, uh, he sometimes still struggles with being afraid of the dark. And so he'll want to go into a different room in our house. And oftentimes what he'll do is he'll find daddy. He'll bring me with him as to say that, daddy, I don't want to be in the dark without my dad. <laughs> and, I, and I sense that this was part of what's going on in David's mind in this text. David tells God exactly what he needs straight up. He essentially saying, this is a really, really dark time for me. And I need you to do me a favor, Lord, and turn back on the lights for me. Is there anybody here praying for the Lord to turn back the lights on, turn the lights back on in some dark areas in your life in this particular season? Turn the lights back on in my family. Turn the lights back on in my finances. Turn the lights back on in my friendships. Turn the light back on. I know that you are a God who is the light, and I know you do it through your word, for thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and, 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 and uh, is a light unto my feet, and a lamp unto my path. Lord, I need you to turn the light on for me, family. It says, Lord, I need you to turn the light on. Light up my eyes. He lets God know what he needs, and that's what we need to do whenever dark times come our way. Now, I want to give you some practical advice here on how to comfort others in dark times, right? Because it's not just about uh, everybody's not in a season of suffering here, but you might know somebody who's in a season of suffering. And so I want to give you some wisdom really quick here. First and foremost, don't judge your faith if you're suffering or that person's faith if they're suffering in the season of suffering. Don't judge your faith by the season of suffering you're in. I remember talking to um, a mother um, who lost her daughter, and it broke her heart, overwhelmed her, and there were a bunch of Christians, help, help them in Jesus' name, uh, like, like critiquing her because she was saying stuff that wasn't theologically accurate and things of that nature, but she was overwhelmed with pain, and a whole bunch of people were trying to correct her theology rather than just crying with her in a tough time, right? Right? What they were doing, essentially, was they were defining her faith based on this very, very difficult season of suffering she, she was in. And here's the problem. In that moment, they were being what you call careless comforters. They were doing what Job's friends did them, talking too much when they should have just been silent and sit down. And they, they didn't need her to lecture her. They needed them to listen to her. And that's what we need to remember, right? And that's what we need to ask people for. I don't, I don't need you to talk me through this. I need you to just sit with me, any of this, Right? I know many men and women of faith, even now, that I get to counsel on a regular basis who are going through very, very hard times right now, and they can't see past their pain. It doesn't mean they're not people of faith. It just means that what they're going through is really, really hard, and I, and I oftentimes just encourage them, don't judge your faith based on this season you're in, right? Right? Because there are many people throughout the biblical narrative, like I said, who went through really, really dark days, right? And dark days are not a sign of no faith. They're actually a part of what God uses to deepen our faith, Amen. Joseph was in the darkness of a pit, but God used that pit to deepen his faith. Esther was in a very, very dark situation when her people were, were being threatened by total annihilation, but God used that dark time to deepen her faith. Ruth was in a dark time, right, when she was, um, um, uh, 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 her, she lost her husband, lost her protection, lost her provision, but God used that dark time to deepen her faith. Paul and Silas found themselves in the dark night of the prison, right, and they were giving praises to God, and God pulled a Tasha Cobbs and broke every chain there in a prison. God used that dark place to deepen their faith. Even Jesus of Nazareth, who was in the grave all day Friday, all day Saturday, God used the darkness of the tomb to bring about our deliverance in salvation. Sometimes the dark place is where God does his best work. So don't ever judge your faith based on the season of suffering you are in. Secondly, family, I want you to properly discern 
your questions or the questions of others in seasons of suffering. You know why, friend? Because all suffering is not created equal. Let me say that again for the folk in the back. <laughs> all suffering is not created equal. And so it's a mistake to assume that every sufferer is asking the same question when they're suffering. In other words, for an example, how long is a very different question than the question of why? <laughs> right? Why is a question of explanation, a search for meaning, for clarity? Right? But how long is a question of endurance, a question of strength, of grace to make it through just another day? So as glorious as Romans 8, 28 is, it's not always the appropriate way to comfort somebody. Because they might not be questioning God's goodness. They might be questioning God's timing. And therefore, it's wise for us to uh, 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 tailor our comfort in a way that's consistent with what question they're asking in that season. Am I tracking? With, are you tracking with me, family? Romans 8, 28 probably ain't always it. It's a great verse. But it ain't always it. Just want to help you all out with that now. Right? Properly discern the question so you can apply the comfort properly from God's word. I got to move. Let God know how you feel. Let God know what you need. Thirdly, lean into who you know. <laughs> lean into who you know. David says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Note the progression of David's focus here. From verse 1 and 2 down to 5. In 1 and 2, David laments what he doesn't know about his circumstances. How long, how long, how long, how long, right? But in verse 5, he leans into what he does know about God's character. Don't miss that, family. Here's the point. In trials, don't focus on what you don't know. Focus on the God that you do know. <laughs> right, right, right. You don't know what's happening with your trials, but you know about God's character. In the words of C.H. Spurgeon, when you can't trace God's hand, you can trust his heart. Is this not what Job did in this time of prolonged suffering? After losing his kids, his health, his wealth, and his wife losing her ever-loving mind and turning to him and telling him to curse God and die, what did Job do? He chose not to focus on what he was going through, but focus on the God who was with him as he was going through and what he knew about that God. How do I know that? I'll tell you why. Job 19, 25, Job says this, for I know, somebody say no, I know that my Redeemer lives. Accelerate Church, one of your pillars here is knowing God. That word know is about intimacy, and it is, in the, it, it is your intimacy with God, knowing who God is that sustains you when you don't know about what's going on in terms of the circumstances around you. You might not know about the circumstances, but if you know God's character, if he came through for you one time, he'll come through for you again, lean into God's character. And in Psalms 13, David starts, focus on how long his suffering would last. But he closes focused on how long God's love will last. <laughs> Listen, here's what you need to know and lean into when you're going through family. God's loyal love will always outlast any suffering you go through. God's loyal love for you will always outlast any suffering you go through. So when a pain hits, remember God's love for you. It never stops. It's never ending. It's literally everlasting. See, one day he promises that he's going to wipe away every tear from, from every eye. And there will be no more sickness, no more sadness, no more sorrow. Death will literally die a horrible death. And we will reign on the earth with Jesus, our King of kings and Lord of lords forever. And, and until that day, we trust in the God who promises us that his love is everlasting. We serve a God who is not the energizer bunny, but he is the Lamb of God. Who keeps on going and going and going and going. How many know that our Lord's love is built to last? You ought to praise him if you know that God's love will outlast your suffering. The Apostle Paul put it this way. The sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. Oh, how I long for that glorious day. This is the power of processing our pain by lamenting before God in prayer. Here it is. Don't miss this. You see this transition from verse 2 to verse 5. Here's what it teaches us. Processing your pain in prayer is often the pathway back to praise. Processing your pain in prayer is often the pathway back to praise. See, David went from pain to prayer and back to praise in five verses, and now he's trusting and leaning on the Lord and not on his own understanding. The word love here in the text is the word hesed, and it refers to God's loyal, never-ending, and forever love for his people. Listen, if you're in a how long season struggling to trust God's timing like David, write this truth nugget down. Here it is. Whenever your sorrows last long, lean on God's longer lasting love. There it is. Whenever your sorrows last long, lean on God's longer lasting love. So let God know how you feel with honesty and humility. Free to express, free not to be, but not free to be entitled. 
Let God know what you need, right? Lean into the God that you do know. Don't focus on what you don't know. Lean into the God that you do know. And finally, we'll go home on this. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 13, verse 6, he says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I'm going to say that again. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Singing even in the midst of his suffering. I love it. So after talking about God's loyal love in verse 5, David uses this word bountiful in verse 6, which means to show one favor, to show one kindness or benevolence. I, I love this, to show one generosity. Somebody say generosity. And whenever you hear the words love and generosity in the same sentence, that ought to cause you to beeline right to the heart of the gospel. Right? John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he what gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, it was Jesus who demonstrated his love and generosity to us when he suffered in our place as a substitute at the cross so that we who was his foes could be forgiven. And as a Jewish boy, he would have grown up learning the songs and the playlists of his day, especially psalms of lament for hard times like Psalm 13. Don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Hebrews 5, 7 says this. In the days of his flesh, that is when he was walking here on the earth, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Come on, somebody. You hear that? Jesus lamented. The Lord lamented. To him who was able to save him from death, and he, heard, he was heard because of his reverence. Why was he heard? Because of his reverence. See, even Jesus offered prayers of lament when he walked this earth family as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Can I talk to some of the men just real quick? Just, 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 just real quick. We live in a culture that teaches men that you soft because you shed a tear. But, 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 but I got a problem with that because Jesus was a man's man. Literally bullied the grave and rose with all power. Right, right, put the demon in the swine, turned the water into wine, literally proved at the cross that he is tough as nails, but he was in touch with his emotions. Don't fall for this toxic masculinity stuff that say you ain't no man because you express sadness, because you express sorrow. Jesus was the greatest man ever, yet he was in touch with his emotions. In fact, during the greatest trials of his life, he played back the playlist of the Psalms in his life. You remember it, don't you? Psalm 22, verse one. He was quoting in Matthew 27, 46, when he says, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? When he was going through the pain, he had the playlist on his lips. You remember him at the cross, right? Luke 23, 46. He's quoting from Psalm 31, verse five, where he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, the text says, he breathed his laugh. In other words, in his greatest moments of pain, he had the playlist on his lips. See, we look to Jesus in our suffering. Jesus who knows what it is to be forsaken so that we can be forgiven. Jesus who endured long suffering on the cross for six hours. Jesus who willingly and generously gave his life so that toe up, messed up, and mixed up people like you and I can find salvation through the cross of Calvary. Nobody knows suffering like him. Nobody knows God's love like him. And nobody took time to recite from God's playlist in the midst of their pain like Yeshua, the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. He is not only our great savior, he is our great example. The one who suffered for us. The one who uh, suffered like us. And the one who is our great God and greatest example to us in terms of what it looks like to use the songs, the ancient playlist of God to help us process and pray through our pain. Celebrate Church, I just want to give you four ways to pray through your pain and prolong season of suffering. Let God know how you feel. While you're there praying, let them know what you need. Lean into the God that you know rather than focusing on everything you don't know about the circumstances. And then look to Jesus Christ who modeled for us what it meant to lean on God's playlist when the pain hit in his life. Kind of want to close in this way. There was a season in my life where me and my family had a, a real how long moment. My sister, who was 14 at the time, she wasn't missing at our home, from our home. For one week we searched for, for two weeks we searched for, for three weeks we searched for, for four weeks we searched for, five weeks, six weeks, no avail, we couldn't find her. Somewhere around the seventh or eighth week, we found her, they found her. 
And sadly, she wasn't alive, to say the least. I can remember us having this sort of how long longing in our hearts. How long are we going to go without this closure? How are we going to deal with this? And it was my mama who's the rock of our family. Her name's Marie. I got to talk about her everywhere I go. In this time, even though she was mourning the loss of her child in this prolonged time before we even figured out where she was, she would pull us to herself at night. And she would talk to us and she would speak to us and she would let us just talk to her about how we were feeling and, and, and how we were hurting and, and how we didn't know how to process everything that we were going through. And the one thing that she would say that still I hear in my mind whenever I'm going through prolonged season of suffering, even now, this is what would keep us. She would simply say, I know it's hard, baby, but we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. I don't know who this is for here today, but as you process your pain before God in prayer, God wants you to know that you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. He's a greater parent than my mom could ever be. And he loves you and has never intended for you to process your pain alone. He says you can process your pain with him, the Almighty, who is your father, who loves you, who cares for you, and wants to hear your hurt. He says, come to me. I love you. I want to hear you, and I can heal you and give you hope even in the midst of your hurt. Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for your word. Uh, well, there are people right here today, watching online or in here, who came here heavy-hearted, feeling like they got to pick up the pieces of their broken life or the hard seasons that they're going through alone. I pray that they would know that you have come to take the weight off today. Let them know, Lord God, that you have never intended for them to process their pain alone, but you've given them a papa who says, come to me when you're heavy laden and weary. Come to me in seasons of prolonged suffering when you're asking how long and come find hope in the arms of your daddy. Oh God, would you meet them in a way that only you can and give them hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But maybe there's somebody here who does not know you as Savior and Lord. And maybe the prayer they need to pray for the first time is for you to be their Savior. Holy Spirit, would you convict them that they are a great sinner? But then would you also convince them that you are an even greater Savior? And help them to trust in you as Savior and Lord so that they too can find a place to process their pain and prayer before you. Oh God, we love you. We praise you. Would you do this for your name's sake, for your glory? It is in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Let the church of the living God say amen. Amen and amen.